Good morning, NSF. I am thrilled to have everybody here. I know there'll be more people joining us as we get the, um, started with our program, but I'm glad everybody was able to join. Um, before we get started, just a few announcements that I want to make for our NSF community. I wanted to let you know that we are um, shifting our program offerings and we will be um, moving once again, we're going to try to move to in-person programs. So you will be seeing an announcement go out um, probably later this week or early next week for a very exciting uh, in-person program that we are planning for early January. And um, what our plan is moving forward is we will do in-person only events, um, which will be recorded. So if people miss them, they can see them later. Um, we will be doing in-person events um, probably quarterly, maybe a little more often, depending on our availability as speakers. And we will intersperse that with the Zoom events. So people will have the option to attend virtually um, if they want to, um, but we will have um, an end. We are moving our in-person events to the lovely, amazing facilities of the Montreux um, Country Club Clubhouse, uh, courtesy of our board president, Kevin Schaller. So, I look forward to seeing everybody in person soon. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker today, Chris Malka, um, who I should say needs no introduction, but Chris, if you would like to give a short bio other than what was already there, please start out with that. We welcome you and thank you for bringing winter with us. Absolutely. No, I, it, as, uh, as somebody who, you know, I grew up in Southern California in LA and so Snow is not exactly, me and Snow don't exactly have a great friendship. Um, but, you know, during the holiday season, I'll, I'll allow it. And, and so I think we'll have some of that uh, coming up here. So uh, I'm a meteorologist with the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Reno. And um, we're one of about 120 field offices around the country. And we cover certain geographical areas. So we cover the western part of Nevada and the eastern part of the Sierra, basically Tahoe, Mammoth, uh, some of the most amazing country in, in the U.S. So I, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to be here. I've been here since 2007, seen some pretty incredible storms during that time frame. Um, but it, they, the character of these storms is definitely changing. And that October storm that we had is evidence of that alone. And I'll touch on that in my, in my presentation. So um, I'll go ahead and get started here. There's a, just a nice peaceful scene. You almost feel like you're in a, you're in a Bob Ross. Um, you're watching PBS. Yes, and Bob Ross is there, he's paying. So uh, wildflowers and, and lenticular clouds. So why am I showing this right now? Well, um, honestly, it's been my experience that um, oftentimes when we have really large autumn rainfalls, we have very big super blooms of flowers the following spring. Um, you know, I, I do a fair amount of running in the uh, trails around Reno. And uh, I've just seen this, uh, Death Valley, they had that really big super bloom a number of years ago that I was actually able to see. That followed a very, very wet autumn as well. And they've done some research to show there is a linkage between those two. Something about autumn rain specifically that triggers uh, flowering later on in, in the, the following year. So, hey, maybe uh, we'll have one heck of a, a bloom this next, uh, this next spring. On a perhaps a heads up note, this probably does sort of load the dice a little bit toward Nevada having a little more active fire season next year because we do depend on having more of that kind of uh, small um, vegetation development to uh, to do our fires here in Nevada. So just as a, it's probably leaning in that direction. Now, if we keep getting wet storms on, of course, that, that'll increase the odds of that. All right, let's get started here. What I'm going to do is talk about what we are expecting for this coming winter. Um, and then I'm going to touch on some aspects uh, as, as a meteorologist, how things are changing both in our jobs, um, but also, you know, factoring in the changing climate, the changing character of storms. How is that affecting our jobs as day-to-day -day weather forecasters. You know, often if you ask an operational meteorologist about climate change, they get all kind of squeamish and I don't want to talk about that, you know, but I've seen enough that, you know, in, in my, uh, you know, 21, almost 22 years in, in the weather service, I've seen, uh, you know, changes in how things are. So I could, I feel, you know, I can opine on that. So drought, fire, smoke, heat, you know, this last summer was definitely one for the record books around here. 
um, in, in more negative ways than, than one. So is this coming winter going to save us all? Is this going to be the winter that just puts everything in the rear view mirror? Is drought going to be gone, gone as soon as we're, we're done? With this? Well, let's, let's find out. So, um, you know, random thing, I do it, these run commutes to and from work. And, and uh, lately I've been finding boats abandoned along some of the routes that I take into work. Now I'm used to shot up, burnt out trucks and mattresses and things like that. Um, I always know to turn left at a certain shot up truck. Um, but you know, boats are different. So does this mean, is this a premonition? Does this mean it's gonna be a, just a really wet winter and maybe the population has some hunch and so they're just sort of stashing their boats up on random hillsides because they know they're gonna need them to get around? Or is it gonna be the other way? Is drought gonna continue and so they're like, yeah, we don't need this. I'm just going to abandon it. You know, there's going to be no lakes, no more lakes, no more rivers or anything like that. Well, yeah, he's done enough. But let's actually get into some science about the coming winter. We'll start with looking at the past summer. It's always important to look back before we look forward. And we set records for heat. Look at that 22 days in Reno that we hit 100 degrees or higher, which sets a new record. And, and the data in Reno goes back to 1893. So that's a pretty considerable statistic there. Uh, Tahoe City, this is a graph showing you the average temperature for June, July, and August all put together for each year dating back to 1910. Look there on the far right, that's 2021, the new standard bearer for the hottest summer on record for Tahoe City. So it wasn't just Reno, it wasn't just Tahoe, it was actually across a good chunk of the West. Anywhere there in red, that dark red set records for the warmest summer on record. So all the way from the Canadian border to the Mexican border, you actually had to go to the coastline of California before you saw anything close to normal or even cooler than normal this summer. So it's just an expansive, hot summer. Any of you have friends or family in the Pacific Northwest, what they went through at the end of June, early July was truly historic. And I will end my presentation, oddly enough, with that um, very event, uh, some, some comments on that. So we now seem to have a fifth season it's known as smoke season here in the California and Nevada. Now, of course, two years doesn't make a trend necessarily, but boy, you know, it's hard to kind of get away from like, is this the new normal? This is what we're expecting. So this is a satellite image uh, during when the Dixie fire was at full rage, the Caldor fire near Tahoe was taking off and look at all this smoke. None of this is clouds. This is all smoke coming into, um, into Nevada there. And so this is back in early August. And I was actually driving back uh, with a family from um, the Tusher Mountains in Utah, where I did a race over there. Amazing mountain range, by the way, if you happen to be over in that area. And um, we came through Ely on Highway 50. And we turned around, you know, a corner of the mountains and, and turned around and it was lit. The visibility is like a quarter mile. I'm like, is the fire like right over there? I mean, it was so thick, but no, it was hundreds of miles away. And so, you know, you have your logic brain. That's like, okay, you know, it, it's smoke, it'll eventually go away, you know, whatever. But the emotional brain is like, to hell with this, I'm turning the car around and we're just going to start a new life somewhere else. You know, and so there was a few seconds there where I was like, hmm. Anyway, so uh, here in Reno specifically, the um, we set records for the worst air quality. Um, now this is data back to 1999. These are PM 2.5 AQI values. Look at that. You know, the, the top three occurred in a sequential order there at the end of uh, August, mainly due to the Dixie fire smoke. And the top 10 now have been all within the last two years. And this is a, a graph of hourly AQI uh, from smoke at South Lake Tahoe ending on September 2nd during the Caldor fire. Look at that. They had four hours, only four hours in a seven day period where the air quality was good. So can you imagine, how do you deal with that? You know, a lot of folks there, they don't have, you know, uh, AC or anything like that. You know, they draw air in from the outside. They open their windows at night to cool off. I'm like, how do, how do, you, how do you even deal with that? So does the smoke affect the weather? You bet it does. Uh, and this is a big thing for us as forecasters. The smoke will act to cool the high temperatures. Um, incoming solar radiation is a lot of it has bounced back into space. So we'll stay five, six, seven degrees cooler than we otherwise might have had. So silver lining if you can find them to smoke, is it, it kept uh, the number of those 100 degree days maybe a little bit less than the 22 it already was. Overnight lows though stay the same. The long wave radiation that escapes back into space at night from the ground um, actually passes right through the smoke as if it weren't there. So you end up with a smaller difference between your high and low temperature on these really smoky days. And sort of related to that, the Zephyr wind 
that's our friend in the afternoons in the summer. It's that nice, cool, refreshing wind that comes in uh, four or five, six o'clock every day. Well, that has been kind of um, MIA this last couple of years. And a lot of it is because of the smoke. The smoke decreases the temperature contrast between Nevada and the Sierra. And that is what drives the Zephyr wind. And so we're not seeing as much smoke. Um, so that won't disperse the, they're not seeing as much of that Zephyr wind. So it won't disperse the smoke as, as much. Again, another silver lining, I was trying to be a little positive, is because of that, we actually missed out on a couple of red flag warning days. Those are those days where we have critical fire weather conditions where if a fire starts, it spreads rapidly. Uh, that the, the smoke actually kept the winds less than forecast. So we ended up not hitting those red flag conditions. So that's something there. Um, let's move along here. And so why have we had so many explosive mega fires? Look at this picture I took on the Tahoe Rim Trail north of Snow Valley Peak this summer. I think you can kind of see why. Look at all the, the pine trees there. They're either in just a sad, sorry state. They, they just don't look healthy or they're just outright dead. And a lot of this is from the drought, um, the big drought that we had back in 2015, but also for the ongoing one that we've had now for the last couple of years. So that's one part of it. Um, the other part is what we call plume dominated fires. And a lot of it is driven by that record dry timber vegetation. These are fires that once they get going, they become so hot, so large, almost like a bomb went off. And you can kind of see some examples there of the clouds. It just looks like a bomb went off that they, they create their own weather and the outside weather doesn't really matter anymore. And so they're just gonna keep going until something really big shifts in the outside weather. So slight changes in humidity and wind and things like that, it does not matter to these mega fires. It really has to wait until you see an early season uh, rain event or maybe a thunderstorm with some heavy rain that finally can, can kind of quell these, uh, these fires. So that's a key aspect of these things is that the outside weather a lot of times ends up not not mattering, but how do we get to these? It's, it's the drought, the record dry timber vegetation. We knew going into this winter, it was gonna be a bad one in the mountains because already in May, the fuel moistures in the timber in the Sierra were at near record low values. So we, we knew that. And if for some reason we end up with another drier than normal winter, uh, you know that kind of scenario is possible yet again. So we're kind of hoping that we get a good snow winter that'll help some of the vegetation have more moisture in it going into next summer, and maybe it'll reduce the risk of these kind of plume dominated fires. Um, also longer and more intense heat waves are a contributing factor to these, these fires. It just, it dries the vegetation out even more and the heat, um, it just adds more energy to it, to these, uh, to these fires uh, through creating a dry and unstable atmosphere. Basically some of the similar characteristics to what you see when you get thunderstorms develop, it helps drive these plume dominated fires. The Haynes index is a measure um, of that. Basically how dry and how unstable is the atmosphere. That's why these clouds look like thunderstorms. Uh, you might've heard the term pyrocumulus or pyrocumulonimbus. That's what these are. And they can again, create their own weather. Uh, we've seen lightning strikes come out of these kind of clouds. We've even seen fire tornadoes. Yes, we get tornadoes out here. And because we live in California, Nevada, we don't just get tornadoes. Our tornadoes are on fire. That's because we're special. So we actually issued the first ever fire tornado warning out of this office, uh, which created all sorts of policy consternation back in DC. It's like, oh, is that really a tornado? Should be issued tornado? Yeah, 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 it's a tornado. It's rotating, it's on fire. We're good. All right, so can I even live here anymore? Let's go from the science to more of the mental health aspect. You know, obviously these fires take an immense property and physical toll. On, on people that live in the fire areas, but everybody around it was smoke. A lot of us, we live here because we enjoy nature. We enjoy the outdoors. It's why we chose to live in this region. And so when we're basically locked up inside for weeks on end, um, or you're stupid like me and just go outside anyway, and you know that may take an effect on not mental health, but also physical health as well, um, you know, what is that effect? You know, is, is there, uh, you know, the, the, the mental health aspect to that? And I always tell people that if you are struggling uh, during these episodes of prolonged smoke, it's like, you know, I can't get outside. I can't, you know, do, you know, my, my running, for example, is my mental health valve to cope with life. And if I can't do that, you don't want to be around me. Um, and so I'm, if, if you feel that way, you're not alone. In, in this situation. And I was listening to um, 
uh, John Ralston's group, the Nevada Independent, they have a great podcast. Usually it's on politics, but they did an episode about people leaving Nevada. And there were a number of folks they interviewed that talked about the heat and the smoke. They're like, they're done with it. And so remember, I kind of joked about turning the car around in Ely before. Well, you know, but there are people actually doing, they, they actually are turning the car around. And uh, so I can't, I can't entirely blame them. So now let's fast forward to something more positive. Let's go to the super duper mega atmospheric river that we had in uh, late October, uh, mainly the 24th and 25th. Look at, there's the uh, porta potty there in Paradise Park in Sparse, not having a good day with this event. Now this atmospheric river, this is one of those storms that, uh, among others, that it, it, it tells me that things are different. You know, we, we, we didn't used to get storms of this magnitude, this duration, this early in the winter storm season. And that, that was the aspect of this storm that was the most notable. Uh, if this had happened in January and February, yes, it would have been a strong storm by, you know, comparative measures. But to, for it to happen in October was highly um, unusual and something I have not not seen. But because it happened in October, uh, so early in the season, after a very dry period in a drought, um, it was largely a beneficial atmospheric river. The rainfall rates never ended up being that high where it caused uh, debris flow issues on the fire. So for the most part, it was a very beneficial storm for us. And, and here's another picture I took down in the Carson Valley near Genoa. You can see the flooded fields there, nice reflections, all, all very scenic with the fall colors there. But on the flip side, in terms of being beneficial, on the flip side, you can see a, a potential problem here is that now that atmospheric river has deposited enough moisture into the ground that maybe flooding is now a concern. Whereas beforehand, it wasn't because everything was so dry. But now if we have subsequent heavy rain events, perhaps it's more of a, a consideration. So here is, here is the storm itself. I love the satellite image. As a meteorology student, you could just write a textbook on this whole thing. But you can see the atmospheric river moving toward California and Nevada there. These are these streams of moisture that bring, uh, you know, 50% or more of our annual snowpack and, and water totals for the Sierra. So very important, very beneficial for us. But of course, if we have too many or they are too intense, then that's where we start having problems like flooding, blizzards, high wind events, things like that. 2017, that's a year where we had probably our, uh, 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 more than our share of atmospheric rivers here. So uh, this storm hit the environmental reset button for the region and, and in a big way. Look at this, here's Lake Tahoe. It rose by half a foot, which by itself, okay, half a foot, who cares? But it's a 191 square mile lake. That's a lot of water. And it's actually only the eighth time in 121 years that Tahoe had a net rise in October. So again, another stat to show how unusual this storm was for so early in the storm season. Here in Reno, we saw 2.92 inches of rain in the two day period, which set a record um, again, back to 1893, a record for two-day rainfall at the, uh, the Reno airport and also for so um, early in the season. Another striking stat, this nearly matched the amount of rain that the airport got in the entire water year ending September 30th of this year, which happened to be the third driest water year on record. So talk about from, from bust to boom, just, uh, just like that. And 2.92 uh, represents about 40% of our annual average total um, for, uh, for Reno, about seven and a half inches. So another big, uh, big stat there for that, that storm. So let's see, let's move along, along here. Does this actually help end the drought? Sort of. And the biggest aspect to it is the soil moisture, which I already touched on. This is a graph looking at the soil moistures for the Eastern Sierra. You can see this black line here went from near record low values to all of a sudden near record high values. And it actually remains at that state. We're definitely above normal on the soil moisture still to this date. So if we have subsequent storms with heavy rainfall, flooding is going to be a concern here in the Sierra and Northern Nevada. So that's a factor for that storm potentially coming in um, early next week if it were to stay more rain than, than snow, which uh, is a possible scenario among many other scenarios. So now let's fast forward a month. Let's look at the status of the snowpack. Here's my daughter, Savannah, and son, Carson. Savannah's leaving him in the dust. So there's, there's drought just going, uh, taking the lead there, leaving winter uh, way, way far behind. But is winter going to do a come from behind here at the finish line? Are we, is he going to make up the pace? Well, the snowpack and the water equivalent, you know, the snowpack there at the top is, is falling below normal in the eastern Sierra. 
Um, but we're still very early in the storm season. And so we have lots of time to make up for that. We just kind of got spoiled there in October and early November with having that big storm. It just made us think that winter was going to be just start off to the races. Well, it's not entirely unusual that we have wet Octobers and followed by dry Novembers. And so to that point, um, I was on a, on a webinar um, a week or so ago uh, and it, I was starting to get bored. So I decided to, to, to take a stab at making a bubble plot while I was listening. And so um, I not my Excel skills are somewhat dormant. And so uh, it took a while to do this, but I'm comparing October precip with November precip and the bubble sizes that you'll see here are the rest of winter precip. So basically that December through March period. This is for Reno dating back to 1894. So as you can see here, uh, there really is no correlation uh, with, uh, there's no predictive uh, power in knowing that October was wet, November was dry. What does that mean for the rest of winter? This year would actually be, oops, would actually be way over here because we had over three inches in total in October and very little in November. So be over here, but what does that mean for the rest of winter? It, there's really, we've had wet examples, we've had dry examples of this pairing of months. So unfortunately, doesn't tell us a whole lot. There's our friend 2017 there, by the way, which did follow that model of a wet October followed by a dry November. Okay, so let's dive into the forecast. How about the next two weeks? You're going to see this, this uh, image here. And you're going to be like, what on earth is this doing in this presentation? I was at Cost Plus World Market here in Reno, which is always a great place to go if you're looking for random stuff. They had the Bob Ross Positive Energy Drink, and they also had the Liquid Rage energy drink. And I'm like, man, boy, you got, you got your choices there. So really, is the forecast going to be some Bob Ross nice little storms, or is it going to be the liquid rage kind? Well, I think it's going to be some of both. Uh, and the liquid range may end up being more of a solid range if you're thinking about precipitation type. So what you're looking at here is our sort of most likely scenario forecast for precipitation and snowfall through Wednesday, December 15th. So this factors in the storm, this little appetizer storm we're gonna get tonight and tomorrow morning, but more so the big stuff, Sunday afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. So some really impressive snow totals here in the Sierra. The yellows are multiple feet of snow all the way from Mammoth up to Tahoe, Donner Pass. Um, and then the, um, this is the precipitation. This is rain plus any snow melted down to a liquid form just to uh, make it equivalent there. So. Uh, that was some really hefty totals on um, good for the snowpack. Now, if it all comes down at once, that can increase the concern for, uh, for avalanche. So that, this is essentially what we call a deterministic forecast. It's one number. And that's largely how we've done forecasts for decades is by giving people that one number forecast. But we have the tools now to provide people with more information, more of a range of possibilities some probabilities, probabilistic type scenarios, threshold probabilities to help folks make more informed decisions ahead of these big events. So to that point, and this is actually in the briefing email um, that I sent out earlier this morning, I took a look at those various scenarios from what we call the national blend of models for uh, snowfall for the mountains versus the valleys here. And you can obviously see a wide range of scenarios still there's still some of the simulations that do produce much less snowfall um, just because of differences in storm track or things like that. But here in Western Nevada in the valleys, a lot of this is because of the rain snow line elevation. Um, there are some indications that the, the rain snow line could still be just off the valley floor. So like places like Reno, Carson City stay at rain. Um, and so that in that case, you may only get a few inches of snow, but more rain, maybe an inch or so of rain, plus a little bit of snow. But if it stays all snow, which I know a lot of us probably would like, we're looking at substantial amounts. And when you get 18 inches or more of snow in Reno, that's that puts the kibosh on most activities around around here. But look at look at how much snow possible in the Sierra. I mean, many, many feet of snow. So this is generally good news, but of course, too much of a good thing is uh, it could create some problems, avalanche, uh, you know, roofs, you know, weight getting weighed down by significant amounts of snow, um, low visibility, all that, all that jazz. So keep an eye on early next week. Now, maybe I'm taking this concept of probability forecasting too far. I did this the other day. I was saying, how many times am I going to reheat my coffee? What's the over under on that? It ended up being four, by the way. So it did, it did go right in between that 25th, 75th percentile. So that was good. Good a good forecast there. All right, week two, uh, it does look to remain cool um, into the Christmas period, the kind of the pre-Christmas period. 
uh, the the forecast here is leaning um, above normal on precipitation, but it's not a it's not a very strong signal. So my my take on that is not seeing indications for really big storms going into that week two period. Um, but overall, uh, winter does look to continue. And uh, just for the sake of time, uh, I'll kind of fast forward through some of this. But this is a chart that we look at um, looking at atmospheric river landfall probabilities. Uh, this is a really useful guidance for us, and you can see a really high probability with those early week storms. Uh, next week. And what's interesting is look at the residence time at the, at the latitude that we're at here, you know, basically Reno, Tahoe. It's for a couple days. That atmospheric river just kind of eh, takes its time coming down the coast. So that could really help rack up the snow totals and the precipitation totals for our area. Also going into Southern California, this one has a really good potential for early next week of being a major rain event for Southern California. So that's a, is a heads up for those folks. And uh, one key thing about atmospheric rivers for us, the direction matters. If they come in from the Northwest uh, for the sea, for our area, it's largely wasted moisture. That's what I call it. It's wasted moisture. It's up there at 18,000 feet, just, just kind of going along. It doesn't hit the mountains at a proper orientation. Now, if you hit it from the West or Southwest, that's like, that's going to squeeze everything out that it can. And that's what we're seeing here with these wind vectors out of the Southwest coming in early next week. It's really, all the stars are aligning for something big early next week. Now me as a meteorologist, and I've been around long enough to be like, all right, what's going to go wrong? Where's the train going to come off the tracks at some point? Cause it just looks too good here at day five. Uh, so we'll, we'll see, you know, we'll see. Uh, going into the uh, Christmas and new year's period, uh, we, we are leaning above normal and below nor uh, for precip and below normal temperatures. So uh, winter potentially continuing into the holiday period. So generally good news there. So for the rest of this winter, we're, we're in what's called a weak La Nina pattern uh, where the tropical Pacific Ocean is cooler than normal. Uh, and so what does that mean for us historically? Well, not a whole lot. You know, up here in northern Nevada and the Sierra, we're kind of victims of latitude, if you will, where there's not as much correlation between um, El Nino and La Nina, what kind of precipitation we get. So you can see in the scatter plot here, we've had very dry La Nina winters. We also had fairly wet ones. In fact, this green dot here is our friend 2017, which was almost a weak La Nina. Uh, it was very, very close to that. And the same for the Sierra. The further south you go into, into Southern Nevada and Southern California, there the dice are loaded toward that drier than normal outcome. They'll still see storms, of course but it's trends uh, more often than not to, to below normal. And that's what the official forecast has for this winter is equal chances. Really any scenario is on the table for Northern Nevada and the Sierra, but the further South you go, that drier than normal outcome does start to become a little bit more uh, favorable at this point. You have to think about it in terms of probabilities since that's where pie charts really come in handy here uh, is it shows you that really any of the three scenarios are on the table at this point. It's just that certain, ones are maybe just slightly more favored than others. The further south you go, you can see that drier than normal outcome. Southern Nevada, Southern California is a little bit more favored. But here in the north, anything is on the table at this point through February and honestly even March. And how have these forecasts generally panned out? This is a Heidke skill score map for the December, January, February seasonal forecasts. Basically, anything in blue is worse than random chance. Basically, you're degrading the forecast, overrolling the dice, which is, that's unfortunate. Uh, anything in orange or red, you're actually improving uh, upon that random roll of the dice. Well, here, again, where we are, because of that lack of relationship with El Nino, La Nina, um, there really is, it's a similar skill to random roll of the dice at this point. Any scenario is on the table. So seasonal forecasts, I love this. They're too good to ignore but not quite good enough to actually make use of. So I'll leave uh, the seasonal outlook at that. In La Nina's and floods, historically, we have had some of our higher water years during these weak La Nina winters. I don't have a physical relationship why this is, but the statistics sort of bear it out, not a guarantee, but uh, going into this winter, it is one of those extra nuggets, especially with that October storm we had moistening the soils up be a little extra prepared for flooding concerns in Northern California, Northern Nevada, going into this, uh, into this uh, core of the, the winter season. So kind of got a few more slides here and then I'll kind of wrap up this sort of a potpourri of some thoughts that I have, uh, you know, into my experiences and some of the storms that we've seen recently. 
Um, I always love this one because, you know, think back to your March Madness bracket about predicting the future. Um, I am the least sports knowledgeable person you could possibly know, uh, but I still fill a bracket out because, oh, that team name sounds interesting. We'll go with that one. So a couple statements here, maybe provocative. All weather forecasts are wrong, but some are useful. Hmm. So Chris is finally admitting what I've known for decades. They don't know what they're talking about. They're always wrong. They get paid to be wrong. Well, yes and no. I, the, the, this is a philosophy change that we're uh, having right now in the weather service is instead of chasing around for, oh, I want the, the high is going to be 67 at Reno today. And you know that you're on a different side of town. You're in a different side of the, the campus or on a different side of the building. It's going to be totally different. Uh, and so you're going to be, oh man, that forecast was wrong. You know, it was 72 here. And like that, that difference really doesn't matter a whole lot, but how can we make forecasts useful to people? And that's where we start factoring in that probability information, the scenario information, the range of possible outcomes to help folks make better decisions. You know, by telling somebody it's going to be that we're going to get two inches of snow at Reno, it's like, okay, well, I guess I can go with that. But if I tell them, yeah, the most likely scenario is two inches, but there's about a 10% chance you could see six out of this if the rain snow line is less. That is helpful. That's useful because it helps people prepare for that possible worst case scenario. So we, we have the data now to be able to do that in a somewhat reliable, calibrated fashion. Another thing, forecasting beyond day three is about being a good statistician. Closer in, it's about being a skilled meteorologist. And we've kind of come to grips with this. You know, we've always been chasing after where's the front, where's the AR, regard, you know, maybe at day six. I'm like, well, who cares? It's all over the place. Every model, it's someplace different, you know? But it's about analyzing the model data in a statistical framework so that you can, again, provide ranges of possibilities, probabilities, things like that. And then as you get closer in, then it does matter as the models become more accurate and higher definition. Where are those meteorological features? Um, you know, that's where your experience in a, in a certain uh, climate regime and a certain terrain environment like the Eastern Sierra matters because then you can nail down, okay, I know where the jet stream is going to be. So therefore the high winds are going to hit Washoe Valley instead of further south or something like that. That's where being a skilled meteorologist comes into, into play. So, you know, we're changing how we do our forecast instead of just saying, oh, the GFS says this, the European model says this. Let's just blend them together arbitrarily or pick one because my gut says that's what's right, which is what we've done for decades. Um, you know, the new way, again, is putting all the models together. And there's hundreds of models, the European, the Canadian, the American systems, the, their ensembles, which each have 50 different members and all that together to produce these scenarios and probabilities with the goal of helping people, public safety agencies make more informed weather-based decisions. And this is an example of that, where we provide that most likely scenario, but also some extra probability information about what are the chances of various levels uh, uh, coming to pass. And I've, I've had experience briefing uh, folks at NDOT as an example. You know, they're trying to make staffing decisions and I tell them, yeah, you're gonna get two inches of snow tonight. And they're like, hmm. Let me, let me put it this way. There's a 90% chance you're going to get some snow that'll stick to the roads tonight, but about a 30% chance you get four inches of snow. And, and, and on the other end of the phone line, it's like quiet. I'm like, uh-oh, did I, did I like totally confuse them or, you know, whatever? And then they're like, no, that really helps me out. That, that gives me a confidence level to help make a staffing uh, go or no-go decision. So we're applying that also to rivers and as well, where we're actually able to do probabilistic river forecasts. This is something totally new this year from the River Forecast Center in Sacramento that does the forecast like for the Truckee River. We're able to provide those range of possibilities of that extra information uh, going into these situations. So I'll finish up with this is these, these model forecasts are getting really good. Uh, even five, six days out, the, especially with the range of possibilities, we're seeing ranges of possibilities of, of things. Uh, and so there's, as the climate is changing, we're seeing these more extreme events while our models are also getting good enough. So they're seeing these extreme events days in advance. And historically, when me as a forecaster see something like that five days out, I blow it off because I'm like, oh, that's just way too, uh, that's just way too crazy. I can't message that. I'm going to freak people out. That just 
this isn't possible. My gut says I can't do that. But well, we've had a number of examples where, again, the models are getting good enough and we see these extreme events. Ooh, we might need to take these outcomes more seriously in the model forecast. And so how do I communicate that as a meteorologist is where we struggle with right now. So here's example number one, the Northwest heat wave. Now back in June, uh, Portland, Oregon actually ended up hitting 117 on, on, I think it was June 28th, which actually is the same record high temperature as Las Vegas. They have the same all time record high temperature as Las Vegas. Who would have had that on their bingo card going into 2021? Here's what the National Blend of Models had five days, six days in advance. It actually had as the top end scenarios 116 to 118 for that June 28th. And we were talking with other meteorologists around the country. How is this possible? Is this right? Is the model broken? Is there something wrong with the land sea interaction, land surface interactions in the model? We we're just going to all sorts of, this doesn't make sense. How is this possible? Uh, you know, some of the atmospherics were like, yeah, it's going to be hot, maybe record hot, but 116, 118, there's just no way. Yeah, never mind. So, this is how do you communicate that days in advance? You know, now, you know, these models again are getting good enough where we have to start taking these scenarios seriously in a changing climate. So we need to figure out ways of communicating this to the public and our decision maker partners in a way that doesn't panic them, but gets them ready for these potential extreme events. And another one, frankly, is our atmospheric river we had in October. That was one, These, this is a box and whisker diagram for the uh, about three, four days out for the Reno airport showing you 24 hour amounts of two to three inches for the Reno airport. And again, we as forecasters are like, how is this much precipitation possible in the lee side of the Sierra? This does, this is, we've not seen this and this model is showing this and it's been showing it for days. And you know, how, how do you, Again, how do we communicate that without sending people into a panic because these high-end scenarios would cause really significant river flooding concerns uh, at, at that point, even though we were fairly dry leading into it. So again, you know, it's a really big AR, but all oh, these wet scenarios just seem totally, just don't seem feasible at this point. The spillover just can't be that much east of the Sierra. Well, you know, on uh, the 25th, I even had three inches right here at the house in Sparks. And we get less rain than the Reno airport does. So uh, this is another example of us having to figure out how to communicate these extreme scenarios. Now that the models are getting good enough and the climate's changing, you put those two together. How do you do that as an operational meteorologist? It's something we're coming to grips with how to communicate that. So uh, I'll finish this up one last thing. A lot of you have followed me for a long time. And you remember when I first started doing briefings, I used to do something kind of fun called the... Uh, wine and trash can scales. Remember the good old days? Uh, my, uh, my folks higher up the, the uh, command chain in the weather service put the kibosh on this pretty, pretty quickly, but you know, for the month or so it lasted, it was good times. So um, I think for the coming storm, I think the trash can scale is actually fairly low. The winds don't look that bad, but you know, you might want to start stocking up on the, your favorite beverage ahead of uh, next week's event. I'm kind of looking down to my, uh, actually I got one of those wine advent calendars at Costco. And uh, it's looking pretty good right now. So I will stop with that. And thank you for your attention. And hopefully you got a few nuggets out of that and we'll go from there. Fantastic, Chris. Thank you so much. As always, um, you not only gave us uh, an entertaining look at the weather forecast, but you actually touched on the issues that are important for us in, in national security, which is how does this information make a difference for communities who are having to contend with that? So we have several discussions with us here today. So I am going to tee up our, our experts um, to both put this in the context of where you're coming from. And then also, um, you know, if you've got challenging questions for Chris, please ask. For those of you who are on, on the participants, please put your questions in the chat in the Q&A and I will get to them momentarily. So with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dale Cox. He is new to our organization. Dale's a long-term colleague of ours. And um, Dale is um, with the USGS. And so with that, Dale, give us your perspective of what this kind of forecast means for planning from the USGS perspective. 
Um, well, first, let me uh, describe what area of the USGS that I'm uh, an expert in, <laughs> which is the development of um, uh, realistic and highly detailed uh, scenarios that can be used by emergency managers, uh, resource managers, et cetera. Um, uh, one of the scenarios that we created was called the arc storm scenario, which uh, means atmospheric river 1000 on a scale uh, yet to be determined. However, we now have determined the scale and it doesn't look like a thousand, it's one through five. Um, and uh, But for us, uh, when we, we set out to uh, create these scenarios, uh, we could only communicate it with uh, statistical flood frequency, but there was a problem with that. Most people don't understand that. They understand what Chris is coming from because he knows how to communicate to a lay audience. Uh, but uh, for us, it was, it was gonna be a difficult proposition, but we created this, these, these highly detailed scenarios uh, so that uh, the community, when I say the community, I'm talking about emergency managers, uh, resource managers, the, the reservoir operations people uh, uh, could uh, all get together in one scenario and that we could form a coalition of people that are all using the same information and communicating it um, with the public in a, in a way that they all understand. So what this means for me with the creation of the, uh, the arc storm scenario is that uh, things are looking better uh, than what I had imagined this year might look like. Uh, the October storm was such a reprieve for us, uh, reprieve, uh, you know, I mean, I live over on the other side of the Sierras than you near Sacramento in the foothills. The smoke between the Caldor fire and the Dixie fire was insane. Uh, it caused a lot of health issues with my family. And, um, and like Chris said, uh, the, uh, the smoke also uh, knocked down some of the temperature, which made it a little bit more inhabitable uh, or habitable in uh, my area. So these storms that are coming in are much welcomed uh, because uh, the, the, uh, the way that we were heading into this, uh, this season was very, very, very scary. Um, so with that, I don't have much more to say uh, coming from my perspective, um, but I'll be certainly uh, answering some questions. Excellent, thank you, Dale. I really appreciate that. Um, we also are very honored to have um, Bob Milish here. Um, Bob is uh, a close colleague of Mike Matthews, who many of you have heard from before. Um, so Bob, would you introduce yourself and then give your perspective for what um, Chris just talked about from your particular area, if you would. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And folks, I, I want to apologize up front and foremost for my inability to uh, pull myself up on the screen and let you see who I am. And I apologize for just being able to dial in a, a DHS and its infinite wisdom and its many, many upgrades to improve our cybersecurity has uh, prohibited me this morning from entering the Zoom environment. So I'm having to dial in. So my sincere apologies for that. Um, I, I really wish I could, you guys could see me. I think we have a better conversation. But uh, getting more to the point, I tell you what a what a wonderful uh, weather briefing. I tell you very comprehensive, um, you know, and I tell you I really appreciate hearing all of that. As I was listening to what I tell you, um, I my head started spinning up all the myriad of things that could affect us um, in the world of homeland security. And you know, so Bob, we, Bob, we I didn't give bit. you. I didn't give you a proper introduction, so perhaps you can explain your position with Homeland Security before you get started. Oh, okay, great. Yes. Uh, so I am a protective security advisor assigned to the uh, U.S. Department of Homeland Security Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, I'm stationed out of uh, San Diego, California. I take care of basically all of Southern California. We do a couple things, uh, just like my colleague, Mike Matthews, who many of you know. We work on the security of uh, critical infrastructure, and by security, we mean guns, gates, guards, ID cards. We look at the resilience, the ability of the infrastructure to adapt to a change in its environment. What we really want for infrastructure is for it to be not only secure, both physically and logically, that is the IT systems as well, but we also want it to be resilient, meaning that it can take a punch much, much like Mike Tyson, shake it off and say, is that all you got? Where I'm coming from with that is that we 
have all these natural disasters that can affect us. Uh, we heard about wildfire, PSPS, winter storms, heavy rains, flooding uh, that disrupt things. And what we would like to do through working with our critical infrastructure partners is to help them understand these things that can befall them, understand the cascading impacts of the loss, and then to develop interventions in which that infrastructure can continue to operate or if it has to fail, let it fail for just a very short period of time and then instantaneously recover, whereas the general public and the operators really don't understand that anything happened. It's transparent to them. So that's kind of my role and where I want to get to in our discussion, having heard everything that I did out of that forecast, I want to focus in on two things. I want to focus in on the dependencies and the interdependencies of critical infrastructure. And by dependencies, what I want to mention is that um, dependencies have a relationship amongst uh, critical infrastructure, assets, and systems. Um, assets being the discrete system that you may know, the substation, the terminal, the hospital, um, and then the system being the ecosystem in which it sur uh, survives. Uh, we want to really think about those as being uh, key to the uh, resilience of our communities, both uh, where you are, where I am, and across the nation. And I want you just to think about the, the usefulness of electricity. We come home and we flip the switch and we expect the power to be on, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether it's cloudy, whether it's sunny. Uh, we turn the tap on the water, we want water to show up. It's all ubiquitous, it's part of our, our culture. We really want it to happen and we don't even want it to, to, to think about it. The interdependencies is that um, the dependency flows both ways. And this is a little bit complex, but I'm gonna try to break it down in a way that hopefully you'll understand it. By an interdependency, I want you to think about um, communications devices, your telephone, your cell phone. The cell phone and or your telephone requires electricity and electricity requires communications because it has to communicate and receive signals. So there's a, a two-way dependency. Without communications, electricity may fail and without um, electricity, the uh, cell towers are probably going to fail. Um, another way to think about this would be water and wastewater. Both water and wastewater require electricity, and electricity requires water. Now, you're thinking about yourself, electricity and water don't mix. Well, yes, they do. Water needs uh, electricity to power the pumps to make the water, and then the electricity needs that finished water to turn the turbines into natural gas production to make electrons. So they are very, very interdependent. So hearing everything we've heard from that uh, weather forecast, and knowing that we're already in an environment where we have a challenged supply system. You've probably heard about the ports being log jammed. We know that we're getting big delays and getting products in. Um, we have stuff waiting offshore, waiting to get here. Um, I really want you to think about your supply chain and then think about that supply chain and the disruptive uh, uh, impacts of a winter storm event, a power safety shutoff, a wildfire, whatever it may be. And I want you to think about the critical infrastructure as the ecosystem. So if you were a business, if you were a hospital, or if you were a water plant, or if you were um, you know, any number of other critical assets, we would like you to think about where do you get all the stuff that makes things happen? Where does your electric come from? Some folks will tell me, oh, it just comes from that box out front. I want you to think about it and where is that substation? How far up the road? Where is the power being generated from? And you know, where does that uh, energy originate from. I want you to think about things like um, over the summer we had a chlorine disruption and I want to tell you about that because this is going to be uh, pretty relevant to this weather event. Over the summer we had some uh, critical infrastructure failures on the east coast and in the gulf coast. It affected the production of chlorine. Chlorine is used in water, wastewater, and in pools uh, to, to disinfect water. Well those gulf coast entities um, were, were hurt because they had some flooding events, uh, took down a couple manufacturers, and then we had a hurricane that took out manufacturing. Um, so we have a reduced supply. That supply cascaded all the way over here to the West Coast. We had water operators that just couldn't get their chemicals. Now, the oddity in that is, is we've talked with owner operators over time. They have assumed that they were a priority and that they assumed that that chemical would always be there, that it was ubiquitous. It was just on an automatic delivery. Well, the point came is that they weren't prioritized and they weren't getting that chemical. What happened is they did not understand their ecosystem or their system of dependencies. Many of them that we talked to said, oh, yeah, I get my 
chlorine from a guy right up the road. What they didn't understand is where that original source of supply was. So this point is that, you know, uh, tropical weather can affect us out here on the West Coast. So that's very, very important for us to understand. These winter storms uh, that we just heard about also affect us. And I want you just to think about a, a, an event that happened in probably 18 months ago. We had a power safety uh, shutoff and they turned off some circuits on the California side. And within about uh, eight to 12 hours, we had a fuel disruption up in your neck of the woods in the Reno area. Well, what happened was the power was shut off to a uh, fuel pump that was pushing fuel up a pipeline um, and we couldn't get fuel up and over the mountain. It took a few hours to figure it out, but when we did, we understood that there was a huge dependency in the loss of fuel. Now, these storms, as they come in, have a tendency to disrupt local power. Um, the accumulation on lines can down a power line, uh, can hurt a substation, uh, just like a flood can, and that will have cascading effects through um, the area. What we want to be able to understand as from Homeland Security and in your sphere is what is absolutely positively critical. And once we start to understand that from a business impact analysis, then we can start to understand how are we going to address this? Are we going to have to have contracts for fuel? Are we going to have to have some sort of a backup device for communications if that's incredibly important to us? Uh, every year we find out somebody new in town who we didn't know about before. Um, you know, and I'll tell you again, a story on, on the East Coast that we worked with um, in, in a winter storm is uh, all of a sudden day five, we still didn't have power. The electric utility was trying to restore power. We got a call from a university that says, hey, I have live animals and a live experiment that we've been doing for a number of years and we're gonna run out of fuel in four hours. Can you get us fuel? And all of a sudden this thing became a problem. Their challenge was they assumed somebody would get them fuel. They assumed that they were a priority, but they didn't make the coordination with the appropriate entities. So having said all of that, folks, I tell you, I've got a few things that I want to ask you to do for yourself and to do for me. I want you to think about your critical infrastructure, whether it's water, wastewater, hospitals, university, research institution, whatever it may be. And I want you to do your business impact analysis. I want you to look and say, what are my needs and where do those things come from? Then look at the things that can befall you. Is it a transportation strike and a lack of drivers that could prevent uh, critical uh, products from coming to you? Is it these winter storms or wildfires or uh, power safety shutoffs that could impact the, the electricity? It sure would be if you were manufacturing uh, printed circuit boards or computer chips, right? So we want you to understand those things and we want you to have a communication with your vendor. First and foremost, we want you to make sure that your vendor knows who you are and knows how important you are. Don't assume that the vendor knows. You're a line number to the vendor. Make sure you have that communication with them. Make sure that you map out your supply chain. Do a map, do an old school map with push pins and, and, and string if you have to, but understand where all of your products are coming from and understand what's upstream. Just don't go to the first vendor who you're using, understand where they get their product from. We want you to understand the difference between contracts and pricing agreements. Um, in the fuels industry, a lot of folks like to buy um, inexpensive fuel. They have a pricing agreement. Hey, we'll buy some. We'll buy it on the, on the rack price or the spot price. But what happens is when there's a disruption um, due to any of these natural hazards, the first guys to get burned off and don't have fuel availability is the guy on a pricing agreement. Um, if you're on a contract, you may get some allocation, you may get some product. It doesn't forestall you from getting the force majeure letter, but we want you to understand the difference between them. We want you to make sure that you have geographically separated vendors. If you're requiring products and you're getting something from Southern California, make sure you're getting products 180 degrees out of the way the other direction. So that way the two storm systems or the two natural disasters or the two man-made or man-caused events aren't disruptive to your supply chain. And then the last thing really want you to do is to verify where you are on the priority list, both at your state EOC, with your local emergency manager, and with your vendor. I really want you to do that. The last thing to say is, I hope everybody understands that these storms can adversely affect electric power. Electric power adversely affects our ability to buy fuel at commercial stations, 
uh, because we don't have pumps to run some of those stations. And even if we did, we can't run the register. The point of sale says really nobody carries cash anymore. So we really just want you to think about all of this stuff in the grand scheme of things, how are we going to get it? And I think the best way I can ever explain it is the Spencer Johnson book, Who Moved My Cheese? If we think about our business and say, who moved my, you fill in the blank, and then start to ask those, those critical questions, where does it come from? How do I get more? And how do I prevent it from happening? I think we can be great. So having said that, um, I want to wrap up my comments because I know we have some other uh, very, very interesting uh, speakers today. So um, with that, barring any questions, that concludes my portion. Excellent. Thank you, Bob, very much for your perspective. And I know that um, you look at this from the San Diego and the Southern California perspective, um, tying that up to the North is very important for us to understand. Um, Kevin Schuller, um, can you just talk specifically to Kevin's, um, to Chris's delivery um, and presentation, what does this mean locally? And how do we use this kind of information? How do emergency responders use the kind of information that Chris just talked about? Thank you, uh, Maureen, and great, great presentation and comments from every, all the panelists. So essentially from a local emergency management standpoint, and we essentially coordinate what the first response agencies do and try to interact with them, is we're taking this information from Chris and from Bob and from Dale and our own experiences and making sure that our systems maintain their operational capabilities, but also so we know how to adjust staffing, for instance, uh, to Chris's comment about NDOT looking at how many plow operators do we need to have on hand? And we do the same thing from the first response community um, in, in order to adequately prepare for this. I will say that in the last few years, um, the data that we get from NWS locally here has been just gold because the predictions for flooding and that have been much, much more accurate than they were. You know, I'm, my first major experience was the 97 flood here, which was fairly significant. Um, and <laughs> like the Reno airport was underwater. So it, it, being able to see a much more granular type data, especially that three day window, because that, that's where we can really ramp up. You know, five days out, it's just, we, we understand it's just, there's too much variability, but in those, those short duration um, uh, adaptations that we do to our systems, it's been very, very valuable. And this new modeling has been very helpful for us. In, in staffing and preparing for this. So it's, you know, to, to many of the other points, those are all considerations that we look at and we anticipate, but it has been very, very helpful, particularly in the last few years, the, the, the accuracy of those, of those predictions. So on that, I'll wrap it up. Hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season ahead. Get the sh snow shovels out, test fire your snow blowers again, because it looks like you might get to use them in a couple of days. Excellent, thanks, Kevin. Um, Chris, um, had, you you got a lot of praise, obviously, for the 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 way that you're changing the 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 forecast and the communications. Um, talk to us just a little bit about how you communicate to people who use this information to do planning. You use the MDOT example, but um, you know, as Kevin said, uh, the information you're now using is incredibly important to. Um, our local communities across the board, whether it's federal, state, local, private sector entities. Yeah, no, it, it, we we interact with a wide variety of folks uh, making weather-based decisions, and so you know, examples are uh, somebody wanting to do a prescribed burn um, is is one example. Uh, you know, mentioned end out the airport. You know, for them, even just a half an inch of snow and it's cold enough, and they've got to really staff up ahead of that. So we're dialoguing with them literally today um, ahead of the storm coming in for tomorrow. Uh, but I think one example pertinent to, to some of these big storms is honestly the uh, like the water master for the Truckee River um, is an example. And they, uh, Chad Blanchard, he is, he is a weather nerd, um, kind of a closet weather nerd. And he's always looking at the models and everything himself, but he will be calling our office once a day at least to talk to our forecaster and say, hey, you know, I see the GFS is showing this, the European is showing that. What, what are your thoughts and what do you think the scenarios um, and, and things like that? 
because among other things, he's trying to make decisions on how much water to, to hold back or release into the Truckee River ahead of a major rain event, potentially. Do I need to add capacity to a reservoir to absorb incoming rain? Or can I keep the flows going? Um, you know, how much is going to come out of Tahoe? Things like that. So we, that's probably, he's probably one of our bigger power users in terms of this new data set. Uh, the probability, the scenario information, the, the, the fact that the models are getting more, more accurate. Um, that's just the, the one example pertinent to these big storms. Excellent, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, there was a question earlier, which I'd like you to address, um, which is the use of all of these private weather stations. Um, so yeah. um, I, for one, have a, I'm looking out my window right now in, in Montana, and there's a Tempest weather station on my front yard. Um, how does the weather service use, incorporate, or not uh, the networks, the growing networks of private weather stations around the country? Yeah, it, it, we we definitely make use of them. Uh, if you get a, a let's say you get a weather station for your house, and it's like Lacrosse or Ambient or Davis or something like that, often there's an option to share the data um, that that comes with it. Um, if that happens, it, it often gets into a system called MesoWest, which is a, a collaborative uh, network out of Utah that takes all the networks together into one resource. Uh, and it's actually a link I put in the, the somebody had asked the Q&A question, I put the link in, into uh, to MesoWest in there. Um, the, so basically, and you know, all the DOTs, the fire weather stations, the airports, uh, the utilities, oh, the utilities, holy cow. Are you talking about expansive weather networks? It's all the utilities here in California and Nevada that are panicked about fire weather. They are installing weather stations uh, so frequently. So there's new networks there, plus the backyard stuff. So all that gets into Meso West, and we definitely um, take a look at it. We factor it into our forecast, and more importantly, our monitoring of current conditions. So if we need to tweak the forecast at the last minute uh, because it's windier or colder or something like that, we'll make use of those. The one challenge with the backyard weather stations that we face is representativeness is we know that the, the airport sites, the fire weather stations, the utilities for the most part are sited well. They're at the right height above the ground. They're usually clear of uh, structures and trees and things like that. Backyard stations, you know, that may or may not be the case and we don't know. You know, we can't physically see the station. Um, so, you know, if the wind is only showing five miles an hour, is that because that's real or is it because it's right next to the house and uh, it's getting blocked by the wind? Like even, my station here out the window, I'll be, I work for the weather service and my station is not properly sited because I just don't have a choice <laughs> of where it is. Uh, I pick the best I can. Um, so I've, I've mentally known to say, well, if it says 10 miles an hour, it's probably pretty windy because it's blocked by some, some trees. So that's the challenge. We definitely make use of the data absolutely through that Meso West resource. Um, but the question is how, uh, how accurate is it? How representative is it of the broader areas is always the question with those stations. Excellent, thank you very much. So I'm gonna wrap it up and say, um, I hope people who are listening to this really recognize that um, it's not just about <laughs> ski season or whether you're gonna get to grandmother's house for the holidays, um, but the situation that we're looking at with weather, um, with extreme weather events, um, and also the forecasting of those extreme weather events is an integral part of a national security. And you heard that from Bob and you heard it from Dale about uh, don't think just locally, think nationally when you're thinking about the context of what the disruptions will be. So storms in the East Coast may have a big impact on us um, in the West Coast. So um, as you move into the holidays, I wish everybody a happy holiday and lots of snowy, um, good snowy days, if that's what you want. Um, but also think about, as Bob said, think about that infrastructure, those interconnections, um, because that's the essence of what's keeping us secure and keeping us resilient. Um, so with that, Chris, thank you very much for a very informative and a, as always entertaining presentation. Thank you. Um, Appreciate it. We thought it was terrific. And I welcome people um, to to send questions if you do have any other follow-up questions. Um, Chris, would you be so kind to put drop into the chat box and say orally, if people are interested in following up with you or learning more about what you do and how the forecasts impact the community, um, yep. how can they get in touch with you? 
Absolutely. I'm putting in my email as we speak. Um, just like most of us, I'm, I'm still doing most of my work remotely. Um, I'm in the office periodically, but we've discovered that remote work is actually quite productive. So I'm doing it more, more of that. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much. I really appreciate everybody being here this morning. I look forward to seeing everybody soon. Um, stay tuned for some emails about our upcoming programs. And with that, I wish everybody a very pleasant, peaceful, safe, happy holidays. Thank you all.